Okay, this evening's presenter is Ron Smith. And uh, Ron was born in Montreal, moved to Fredericton in 1973 to attend the University of New Brunswick and decided a, cre in, uh, a career in forest research was better conducted in New Brunswick than downtown Montreal. Being a small queen enthusiast, he purports to have been collecting stamps since just before the dinosaurs ate the leftovers from the Montreal Gazette building. Now see, there's some humor. His main collecting passions are fancy cancels on small queens and the postal history of Fredericton, New Brunswick, pre-1900. However, he also collects most everything in small queens and is always looking for fellow small queen enthusiasts to swap with. Ron has been active in the Fredericton District Stamp Club for over 40 years, including a 25 plus year stint as president, recently graduating to past president. He is a longstanding member of the RPSC, PHSC, BNAPS, and the CPS of GB, and more recently the AASPE, which I don't know what it stands for, Ron. Uh, could maybe you enlighten us? What does that stand for? Hey, but that's the American Association of Philatelic Exhibitors. Oh, I didn't know there was an S in it. I thought it was just the AAPE. Typo then. <laughs> okay, good. I'm not the. Old, I'm glad I'm not the only one who does typos. He's also a member of the PSSC and was co-chair of the 1999 Royal and chair of Benapex 2016. He is a regular contributor to the BNAP's Fancy Cancel newsletter, but also Fredericton, uh, Fred, Fr sorry, Federation and Dots and Scratches. He has shown various Fancy Cancel exhibits locally in the Atlantic Canada region at Benapex, the Royal and Novapex. He is an avid sports enthusiast, having played competitive sports for most of his life, especially rugby bas and basketball, and continues to be active in cross-country skiing, running, and kayaking. His wife, Liz, and he work hard at trying to keep up with their three adult children in various outdoor pursuits, and recently they have added keeping up with grandchildren to the list. That's the toughest part, Ron. So Ron's presentation tonight, and, and this time I kept my notes, uh, is Fredericton Post Office and its postmarks pre-1900. So I give you Ron Smith. Thanks very much for the intro and for the chance uh, to give this presentation. Originally, I was going to do this at Oropex Breakfast about a year and a half or two years ago or whatever it is now. Time is just flying by. But anyway, so essentially, as the title implies, what I want to do is give you an overview of Fredericton, post office, postmarks, and so on. So my presentation really is broken into three main sections. I want to give you a brief touch on the early history of Fredericton, because it really does give you some context for some of the significant uh, postal events and activities around Fredericton postal history, post offices and postmasters, and the majority of the presentation will in fact be going over postmarks. So history 101, for those who may not be familiar with it, is that you notice in this map, it says province of Nova Scotia. And that encompasses what is New Brunswick and Nova Scotia now. So in other words, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia were one province at one time. And after New Brunswick became a colony unto itself, the uh, very quickly, some of the areas, particularly those around Fredericton, were divvied up with various land grants. And I'll get into some of this, but the context of land grants and the activities and where things happened are important. So I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this, but it gives you an idea. The, one of the key factors here, if you look at it, at the top where that red box is here, that in fact was a First Nations uh, village, 
community there. And it preceded any, obviously, the uh, 1600s settlers that came to Fredericton. But this basically is Fredericton in the north where the river is going east-west. And it just gives you a context. But River, notice map of the River St. John in the province of Nova Scotia. So this is what the grants that were granted or put out in 1765. And this is a view of the megalopolis that is Fredericton and was Fredericton around the turn of the century. That's one of the earliest uh, depictions of early Fredericton. But what this diagram shows you is, is that there was a detailed plat survey, or in other words, a survey of this, and that picture illustrated roughly where that red box is highlighting on the screen. But it was divvied up into many, many lots. And as most people would be generally familiar with, 1785, there was a serious migration of loyalists up. And many settled in St. John, but some also were given land grants and lots in Fredericton. So getting into the actual post offices themselves, okay? Now, this photo of a house that was built around 1790, it was called Grape Lawn, and it was built the original home of Garrett Clopper. Now, just remember that name because I will get into some details on him in a minute or two. But basically, he came up with the Loyalists. Uh, the key was for this is that he, as I'm going to introduce you, was the first postmaster for Fredericton, but he is not credited with formally being a postmaster in the Library Archives of Canada. And I'll get into these details in a minute or two. So, and given the lack of documentation of any formal post office in Fredericton, it's a bit of speculation, but there are some indications that the very first post office in Fredericton actually was out of his house and that was not an atypical thing to happen when a postmaster might be running a post office out of their home or out of a, a business. So admittedly, there's a, a modicum of speculation there, but there's some evidence pointing to that. But there's nothing definitive saying that that was the first post office. Around the turn of the century, Province Hall was constructed. And Province Hall was the government offices at law and such. And the building on the right was the surveyor's office. And it has been in some publications stated that a small wooden building adjacent to Province Hall served as the first formal post office in Fredericton. I was not able to discern whether they were referring to the small structure immediately abutting up to Province Hall, or in fact, the building where there's a little bit of a space beside on the right hand side there, which was the surveyor's office. I don't know which, but essentially it was reasonable to say that the first post office in Fredericton was located there in that complex. And that complex, if you, this picture looks a little bit uh, familiar, is circle right now where it says there are government buildings and so on. So that just gives you an idea of the very first formal post office building in Fredericton. The subsequent buildings that were identified as post offices there were three in the 1800s for the time period that I'm talking about, okay? There was one on the Queen Street above York, one on St. John and one near Carlton Street near Queen. And you'll see these are two postcards. The one on the left is the 1867 
John Thurston Clark Memorial Building. Basically, that one served as a post office until around 1913. And the postcard on the right is a photo card of that uh, newest building, but it was post 1900. So I'm trying to stay on task. But that building served as and just generally known in Fredericton as the old post office. And if you were to look at Again, this plat picture, just to show that those three buildings, not necessarily in order, but their approximate locations are illustrated there by those little squares. So as you say that it was all happening right downtown off of Queen Street and King Street in Fredericton. Now, last tidbit of bit of the history here context is I wanted to give a, a relative positioning or location of Fredericton versus St. John. St. John was the original capital of the province and some decisions were made that eventually the capital was moved to Fredericton. Arguably some of the biggest or the biggest reason for the moving of St. John or the capital to Fredericton was a result of the ongoing, I'll just say it, minor disputes or minor skirmishes with our neighbors to the south. St. John was regarded as being too susceptible to attack and so on. From And as you would probably know, Maine is right down to the lower left-hand corner. And so with a postal history context, might say that, okay, all roads lead through Fredericton for the routes. And this diagram is taken from Arnell book, but it essentially showed that obviously the sea, Halifax was the main uh, receiving port for ships and mail. And prior to 1812, the route went overland to Digby and there was a ferry across to St. John. And there was a lot of, uh, problems with boats getting through with the mail to St. John at that time, whether it be pirates or what have you. So again, the history is the fact that Fredericton, out of necessity, if you wish, became a more important uh, conduit for most of the mail going to the rest of Canada or going west. So Fredericton Postmasters, I'm getting back to Garrett Clopper, as I said, to try to keep that first name. One of the first things you find out when you're trying to do research on some of this older literature is that there are lots of, we talked about typo errors before. Well, there are a lot of transcription errors and there are people who would misspell names. So when you start trying to dig up information on it, so you'll find Garrett Clopper's first name spelt two ways and last name with one or two P's. But there's some interesting tidbits about him coming forward. He was a Lieutenant in the New York Volunteers and uh, his property as of many were, who was a loyalist conf property was confiscated in the Amer American Revolutionary War. He moved to Fredericton, as I mentioned, built a uh, great, he held, a whole suite of offices, as many did. In this case here, deputy master, postmaster, pension officer, and sergeant in arms. Uh, Jeffcott, Green, and Young cited uh, British American Almanac for 1792, saying that Clopper served as postmaster until around 1800. But the last interesting thing, and it will come to play in the next couple of slides, is that... Uh, his family was of Knickerbocker stock in New York. So the land that he, that he had that was confiscated was 33 acres on Manhattan Island, the current location of the New York Stock Exchange <laughs> or the Knickerbocker Stock Exchange. So moving on to more postmasters, this is from the Library and Archives Canada. Again, there's a lot of holes and I guess I'm, I'm saying this, the fact that I'm trying to in this presentation also point out that there's still room to 
find a gem of a, a an old piece of literature somewhere to close in some gaps. Stephen Jarvis was the first postmaster. You know, basically the first date is when they're officially acknowledged as starting as to be postmaster, and the second one is the ending date that is recorded here in the archives. And you'll notice like Stephen Jarvis, I put 1809 question mark. He moved to Ontario in 1809, but there was no postmaster listed between 1809 and 1811 when Andrew Fair took over. Maybe it just took a while for the paperwork to catch up, but arguably Jarvis back then would have had a hard time serving as postmaster of Fredericton while he was living in Ontario. But anyway, this is just little, and there's some blanks there because usually they provided a so-and-so stopped being postmaster because he died or moved or something else. Well, there are some gaps that one consumed just was succeeded or whatever, but there you notice there's some gaps there. So uh, it's still a work in progress trying to fill in some of those holes. It makes it a bit fun always looking for stuff in, in sort of random places. And the other tidbit here, all I'm just going to mention on this slide is that from about 1811, see 1875, it was a fair affair for being postmasters. The, the clan fair pretty much ran the Fredericton Post Office for half a century and change. I want to get back to Clopper here for a minute because, it, again, some history. And this is one of my fun covers is that it's a soldier's letter 1795 that is addressed to H.G. Clopper, who was a son of Garrett Clopper. OK, and again, the families, this stuff, it's it's a nice cover. It's Fredericton Postal History related. It's got a couple of things that it was written in a different style. You notice in the red for the prepaid, it was marked as P1, not the usual 1D. So sometimes it, it took me a while and I actually spoke to a friend of mine, Claude uh, Michaud, and he was the one who had to explain to me what that marking was because I had not come across it before. So again, it's a thing coming in, it was mailed. But here's the thing. When I mentioned about Knickerbocker stock and financial and everything else, H.G. Clopper was a mover and shaker in Fredericton as well. And almost similar to Connell, he managed to make sure that his mug was put on to the $5 bill of the People's Bank of New Brunswick. So this photo here is H.G. Clopper, the son of the first. Again, an interesting tidbit. But at least this one here also had Her Highness on it anyway. So as I said, most of the time it postmarks. So what I'm gonna do is go through, and this is more or less chronological, but as you can imagine, both from these sections and everything else, there is some periods of overlap just because there are, but I'm gonna go through it in this order. Just trying to give you some examples and talk about a couple of interesting covers and uses and some unique things that are happening or happened with some of the Fredericton Postal history materials. So manuscript markings, those were before any hand stamps and everything else. Essentially, if you look at the Handleman's Guide and everything else, there are only two Fredericton manuscript covers documented in it. I have not seen any others. And I've been fortunate to be able to pick up both of those in my collection. I would love it if anybody knows of any others, just so that I'm not telling lies in this. But again, these were obviously one, the first one's 1795, the second one's 1798. But I have been looking for Fredericton stuff for some time, auctions and so on, and dealers, and I've never seen another Fredericton manuscript besides these two. Then subsequent to the manuscript markings, the, uh, there was the introduction of straight line hand stamps. 
And these were introduced by Christopher Sauer, deputy postmaster of New Brunswick. He introduced hand stamps in 1785. And many people, I know Derek Smith in the audience would be very familiar with the fact that uh, there's straight line types used in St. John and they were used in St. John before they were used in Fredericton. But the first one started to be used in Fredericton in 1797. Now, this is another area that there's still room for work, investigation, and sorting out fact, well, not fact from fiction, sort of sorting out the details of the information. So arguably the first uh, publication that documented a lot of this was Jeff Cott Green and Young. And this is again, a page straight out from that book. And as you can see here, there he lists five different Fredericton straight line cancels. And again, these are just the cancels pre-1900. So again, putting it into context because there were some ones done subsequent to that, but I'm only focusing on pre-1900. When you go to McManus, and that's the postmarks of New Brunswick, another important reference, he introduced a sixth one, and that's the red arrow there. Basically, uh, those diagrams in his book were copied from Jeff Cott, Green and Young. And the one 1799, which is that one there, that was a hand-drawn rendition of the cancel, because I'll, I'll show you the scan of the actual postmark in a minute. And then recently, Postal History Society of Canada posted a census of covers with the Fredericton uh, straight line cancels, and they list seven different. So here's where I'm going to just throw some stuff, food for thought out here. So that's the state of the information on these as it stands. I would like to suggest this is that, okay, if you look at closely at these, and I have eight or 10 of these covers, but I don't, you know, and I've got scans of pretty much everything that's been offered in auctions and such. Now, some of them aren't great because the postmarks themselves aren't great, these scans, but I hope you can see these images because I've tried to focus on. So there's two major classes. There's an abbreviated name for Fredericton, and essentially it's with and without an E. And in the literature, it's saying with and without or serif and sans serif. Uh, I'm not sure that I believe that there is serif and sans serif from everything that I look at on the scans. I think that it might be a function of the quality of the strikes. But that's, again, my speculation. And then the second part is Frederick the name spelled out completely. And then these come in various combinations with and without a date and the date itself being in a straight line or offset, whether it be positioning of the date ahead of the name of the, of the month and so on. It has been mentioned and I am a fan or sort of tend to ascribe to the idea that most of the differences are due to removable elements within the cancel. So they were probably uh, either, whether it be the punctuation marks and or numbers and letters for these. As an example, I, I only have a small, I, I, have pro, I have less than half of the known covers that I've been able to find. And as it happens, I have two different cancels from what those are listed in all of the censuses. And, if, and that's because these have different punctuation marks showing in the cancel from any of the other ones that are listed. On the, uh, and in this case here, the October comma 10, 1799. So it's the comma is the one that distinguishes that one. And then the, uh, February 24th, 1800, if you notice the Fredericton, New Brunswick, there's no postmarks and there's nothing that has a straight line without any punctuation marks in the date and the Fredericton itself. So 
these are subtle. I mean, it's been suggested that the differences were based on whether it's six millimeters or six and a half or seven millimeters tall letters and so on. But I, I'm not a necessarily a believer of that level because I don't think that anyone has ever had all of these covers in front of them so they could actually physically measure the covers. And you know you can't measure sizes of letters from scans, photographs, images, and so on. So here's what I've done and this, and I'm, I would welcome any outside. I've gone through everything that I've been able to say. There's about 19 covers that have been listed with Fredericton straight lines and the years. And so all of the ones with the numbers on it are covers that I've actually managed to see online or own. And the two extremes are in fact, covers that are listed in the Postal History Society of Canada page in their census, but I have not seen. So anyways, it's just, I'm leaving you with this for one, hoping that there's a bunch of you out there with some Fredericton straight line cancels that maybe we can uh, share information and build on the knowledge and this particular aspect of it. Now, Moving on, th there's been, as most post offices, quite a suite of different cancels used over time. Uh, so I will be going through these more or less again, chronologically, not a ton, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on the latter two double split rings and solid rings. Uh, many can be found as dispatch, transit and receiver stamps and we've got covers and could do that. So it could be all night just going over examples. That's not it, but it'll be a bit more time on the first two, three categories here. And hopefully it'll become a bit obvious. So this is, I would argue my favorite piece of Fredericton postal history. There are only two recorded covers, okay? Uh, the one in the middle, I apologize that the image isn't that great, but it's the best I could do taking the image from uh, the microfiche that was published online from the UNB archives, because this was part of material that was stolen from New Brunswick archives. And uh, Derek, you'd be obviously familiar because there was an individual who was going around and pilfered a ton of stuff from Nova Scotia as well at the same time. This cover was listed in a name sale recently for sale, along with a bunch of other, I'm not, I'm deliberately not mentioning names because not with a, along with a bunch of other material from Saunders correspondence, which was the material that was stolen from UNB, but it was pulled from the auction. Once the auctioneer was made aware that it was originally stolen material from the archives. But essentially two covers. Uh, well, it might Sometimes it's nice to say that then I think I ha have the only legal cover with this particular postmark on it in private hands. Again, if anyone out there has any thing that would add to this that would say no I've got one or two of these I would love to hear it but I'm just saying I'm doing it from the best that I can present here on this but this particular letter has got some other attributes to it which I really find fascinating okay so this was written by Jonathan Bliss okay and his, Henry Bliss was one of his two sons okay but this letter was actually has two letters written on a single sheet to his son, Henry Bliss, and then William Blower's Bliss. What's interesting, the letter addressed to Henry for, and this was the covering one, is dated June 24th, 1815, you see in the upper, whereas that the letter to his brother, William, is dated May 24th. Now, what's interesting is the look at the dates of the letter 
and the date of the postmark. It's May, it's the 24th of May. So obviously I would speculate that the June 24th uh, was a writing error on Jonathan Bliss's part. And this is just another copy of a letter also written to him. It's showing this, a copy of this uh, large split ring, but the writing is the same and it's now William Blower's Bliss, also the King's College Windsor. And via St. John Digby paid 11. So those were just sort of, those are fun covers doing the, legwork trying to figure out the where to, what's and how's. Double split ring cancels moving in. Uh, a number of slides here I'll just show, starting with the proof strikes from the Pritchard and Andrews uh, records. And as I'm sure everyone knows that uh, Hughes published a whole suite of volumes on the various uh, Pritchard and Andrews proof strikes. So there were two proof strikes for the Frederick and Paid. These were nude, as they call it, nothing in the center. So that enabled the postmaster to write the rate that was appropriate in the center of the circle or something close. Like a, a local one, the three penny one here, and then one and 11. So, Essentially, these were one, they're not overly rare or anything, but they're interesting. Uh, in this era, however, there is one that was neat in the solid rings is that there was a very short lived typo in the solid ring cancel. I'm only aware of two covers with this typo on it where that Fredericton, instead of a K, they have an X in it, thus the arrow. Again, love to find out about more if there are, but it's a, an interesting one. I'm not spending a lot of time on the rates and the routes and everything else, because that's a presenta another presentation unto itself. It would all, this is already a, a lot, fairly long presentation. So, Next class of markings, I was going with the rate marking hand stamps. Manuscripts, they were the, generally the first ones used and different formats were used. Sometimes they did the manuscript and it showed the two currencies on the same. So one and one versus over one dash. So, you know, the, the cents and sterling. So some, you can find the manuscript markings with both written on the same cover or either or depending on what happened. And so when you, and then also sometimes during this period that when they introduce these double split rings where they have Fredericton paid and they put the date in the center, then it was up to the postmaster to write again, manuscript the rates and this one here, uh, a few months difference, but one could argue that it was probably the same postmaster writing that uh, in July versus October in 59, because the threes look awfully close together in terms of the style and so on. Uh, in 1860, rate marking hand stamps were introduced. Prepaid, there were hand stamps of two formats, one with the upper one paid five cents. And there was also the five cents without the word paid above. And again, these are all ones that were used in Fredericton. Uh, as many would probably be aware that generally speaking, that if it was prepaid, it was to be inked in red. And if it was uh, not prepaid, it was usually black ink. This five is, is the best five cent I have. It's actually red, but it's on a blue cover and somewhat oxidized. So it doesn't look quite as red as it might have 
uh, 150 years ago. And there's the two covers that go with that, just to show that uh, that was the five cent. That was the prepaid rate. At that time, if you did not prepay, the rate was seven cents. Or in other words, unpaid mail. And as it happens, this seven cent one was coming into Fredericton. But when you look at the letter, it was actually mailed from Fredericton to Fredericton. But there's no other postal markings. So this one was actually the one that was applied in Fredericton. If it had been mailed from a different city, then many of the other post offices had similar, if not the same, uh, postal rate hand stamps. And this just shows one there of a 10, a paid 10 cent again. And all the post office, Fredericton included, were given a whole range of these hand stamps with various values that corresponded to different letter rates, distances, and so on. In this case here, the 10 cent was a relatively common one because it was letters to the states. And as you see, it's letter to Providence, Rhode Island. This one, a bit interesting again, is it does two things. One, it was saying the 10 cent rate to the states, or actually, to, sorry, to Canada East via Portland. You may be familiar that there was an arrangement that mail going from New Brunswick to, the, to Eastern or to Western Canada or to Canada or Canada was allowed to be put into sealed mail bags and go through Portland, Maine. Okay, it was basically traveled by mail in closed bags. But in this case, that the postmaster said it was going to Portland, put the wrong charge on it of 10 cents because mail was to be charged three cents if it went via Portland, as was clearly indicated on this letter. So the error was caught at the Fredericton Post Office, corrected, and the correct three postage put on. However, that was the intent. When you look at all of the back stamps and transit markings on the back of this envelope, that list, Fredericton Mail, December 26, it went to St. John, then back to Woodstock, New Brunswick, for the, uh, then to Quebec, then to Montreal, and has received Papineau on January 6. So the letter on the front tells one story, but the transit markings uh, clearly indicate that it didn't quite go the way that it was intended to go. British claim markings. Here's another one that's, uh, I don't have any examples, but apparently these were two markings that were used in Fredericton and they were used in other post offices as well for claims with mail coming in. Basically mail, is, uh, the packet letters coming in and uh, when they were not prepaid, it went in and these hand stamps were provided to be put on envelopes to say, okay, before you get your letter, you have to pay X amount. Markings for information. Again, some more things. Uh, free hand stamps. Two were documented as being, uh, have been in Fredericton and they basically differ in the size of the letters. So these are just two covers showing one of each, 78 and 80. And what's neat about these, they're both, uh, addressed to Glazier in Ottawa. And John Glazier was a longstanding senator uh, and politician from Fredericton and New Brunswick. Likewise, similar to the free stamps, two different paid sample, paid in circle cancels have been recorded or recorded. And this just shows, and clearly it's all about the different stamps, sizes of the words paid and so on. This one, 
there's again, I, I'm referring to what people have reported in various articles and such. The word paid in a straight line like this is generally listed as in general use in New Brunswick and elsewhere. So this is just one example of one that originated in Fredericton and obviously it was a, one of those cancels that was used in Fredericton. Now, here's another, it's an interesting one is that uh, I had to do a lot of work because I knew nothing about these. I didn't know what an accountancy stamp was for transatlantic mail. <laughs> And essentially the rate for a half ounce letter from the UK to Canada by British packet via Halifax now, that's the important thing, was reduced to six pence sterling or seven pence a half penny currency on March 23rd, 54. So this one here, but now there's a number of them, but it wasn't until I actually got a copy of the book by Montgomery and Mulvey and the detailed treaties they have on transatlantic mail where Eureka moment arrived where they actually provided the details that enabled me or anyone to say, okay, was this one applied in Fredericton or not? And it came down to counting the hairs on the derriere of the tsetse fly. You're talking about a shortened divisor in the half mark for the seven and a half compared to the other marks. And the position of the dot for under CY is dead centered under the curly Q of the Y. And for the other ones, those they're longer dividing lines and the, that dot is in a different location in the cancel. Uh, yeah, that could be regarded as someone who likes anal retentive or minutia to be able to do this. But that book is a was a phenomenal help. I didn't know it existed. I saw it, got it, and then I could finally make sense of the cover I had. <laughs> Thus, publishing, getting the information out on all these things, the importance thereof. Here is one I would love. It's listed. Fredericton, New Brunswick, I have never seen one. And all I can say is that I have asked every postal history dealer that I know, and none of them have ever seen one either. So, but it's in a book. If someone has one, yes, I would love to try to acquire it from you. It'd probably have to put out a second mortgage on the house or something, or at least see it. But it's just a, a fun one. Again, that's the beauty of this hobby. It's always able to unearth something that you need to find answers to, questions. Now, moving along into some of these postmarks, New Brunswick numeral grids, most people will be familiar with those. There were three general types. And types one and three here were used in Fredericton. And... The number for Fredericton is 13, and I'll show you that in a minute. So the context is that's why it's one in three, because the space or of the numbers of broken bars enabled or allowed for inserting two digits instead of just one. And that's the way these things are distinguished. And this here, just showing that uh, just a, a close up, hopefully be able to see it, but the 13 there in the cancel used. Post-Confederation, postmarks. Again, some uh, more of these uh, proof strikes from the books from Hughes, just showing basically there were two different uh, single split rings used in Fredericton, one with Canada and one with NB. There are a whole suite of full circle proof strikes. 
And these are quite common. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail trying to give examples. As you might imagine, there's variations on time marks, 9 p.m., 10 a.m., and so on, a.m. versus p.m., slight differences in the size, whether it's Canada or New Brunswick in the bottom of the circle, and so on. So there's just a whole suite of these. They were all used in Fredericton. I want to talk a little bit about the Fredericton numeral cancels. Okay. Two main ones are the Fredericton two ring numerals. No secret to these things. And the Fredericton two ring, uh, the Fredericton 11 in Bard's circle. Two ring numeral cancels. I want to give a, a note of thanks to Alex Globe because he probably has the biggest collection of the two ring numerals. I mean, I've talked to Bill Radcliffe and he showed me what he has as well. Okay. The two people, but Alex kindly sent me scans of what he had of the Fredericton covers and that added to what I have and what I information I got from Bill was essentially enabled me to say, okay, what daters were used in combination with the two ring numeral and when. And it sort of played out this way. So you can see that there's a bit of a gap in terms of the use of the two ring numeral for Fredericton uh, with some of these anyways. There's probably some covers around with the two ring numeral that would fill in between October 70 and March 78. I just have not encountered any yet. One of the other things is that, and this is something I, I don't know, but maybe someone is more familiar with it. And I'd love to have this answered after is that I've got a lot of split ring cancels that predated the Pritchard and Andrew proof strikes. And having taken a number of covers, I said, okay, the only thing I could do to look at it was took the, taking the covers that I have, and I have quite a few, uh, but I have 40 Fredericton covers with these single split rings and measured the diameters and looking, looking for other differences. And there was nothing that I could discern that separated those from the spring, the split rings that were used subsequent to the Pritchard and Andrews proof strikes. So in other words, as I say, 23 before and 17 after. Again, open to suggestions as to what was going on. If someone knows if they were just retired or what I'm not aware of was how the Pritchard and Andrews proof strikes came to be in terms of whether it was, they were already in use and then pages were made up and then compiled at that time or what have you. I'm open to information on that just for curiosity, if nothing else. Fredericton court cancels, moving right along. My intro to this is compared to things like Ottawa, where there's huge numbers of fancy geometrics, Fredericton court cancels for the most part are pretty boring. But what I'm doing, and I just want to draw attention, hopefully most of you are familiar with what, what Mike Hallett has been doing in compiling a uh, number of started with Ottawa. And essentially, uh, many, many folks are contributing to various senses, basically scanning covers, sending them, and he's putting them on a shared drive site. So that in this case, he's got over 250 Ottawa fancy cancels. A number of us, I know Derek has contributed some to this and myself, St. John over 113 and several other cities. I will be putting up soon about 85 covers to Fredericton to do the same thing. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is this using the new technology, it's a wonderful way to tell the story because the covers, the way they're named is in date order. So therefore, when you go to the site, you can see how 
the cover the, the cancels changed and or they morphed sometimes when cancels became worn and they looked differently over time. So that's a wonderful way to get many folks to contribute to a common project and then see all of this stuff. And as the numbers increase, the story gets better. So then what I essentially wanted to do is like kinds of things I'm doing with Fredericton, just basic radial cancer with eight segments. So I, I have covers with this cancel dated October 13th, 81 to December 30th, 81. And then this one, which is a variant of it, it's eight segments again, but if you take a close look that the lines don't intersect at the center. So that with this offset, I've got cancels April 81 to October 81. So it's only by having a number of covers together to look at, you're able to start telling stories like this is how the can different cancels and how they morphed over time. This is arguably one of the nicer court cancels from Fredericton across style one. It's, it's a very nice cover. And I'll just show up a close up just because of that. It's got a couple of things going for this with registered and so on. I'm not aware of any other covers. There's got lots of stamps with this, but I'm not aware again of any other covers with this cancel on it. And then more less exciting, more generic cork cancels. Uh, there's a ton of commercial postcards to the Maritime Bank to various locations, but originating in Fredericton. So there's a lot of uh, different corks and building a story, which ones were used when a number of these corks can be found on covers as well, but this just showed just a variation. I wasn't going to go through all of the different combinations and dates. This is one of the fun ones. Again, it's all about finding out information. And I've written up a little article on this one uh, before. Fredericton F, okay, it's listed in, it was listed in Day and Smythes and in, in, in the editions of LaSalle, okay? This is a photocopy of the only recorded cover and it's from the Smythes collection. I would love to find out who has this cover, but that's another story again, being greedy, self-serving. But in all my years, never found another cover until fairly recently. How's this for a Fredericton F? It probably, the key is, is you got to look at the date, right? Wait a it probably doesn't jump out at you as a Fredericton F compared to that previous cover. However, with a little bit of technology and magic and taking it, rotating it and cleaning some things up, you can see that the lines line up pretty well, the orientation and so on. So the question I want to throw out there is, is the Fredericton F legit or is it just a different state of the deteriorated cork that was the one that's in color to the left or is I don't know, or, or in fact, is the deteriorated cork one on the left a deteriorated state of the Fredericton F? So it would be really nice to find more of these, but I've not seen any others. And as I'm winding down, I've spoken long enough here. I've just got a couple more slides. Fredericton squared circles. Yes, Fredericton had, there's been a nice article written up on time marks and everything else. So I just couldn't not at least mention that, yes, Fredericton did have a squared circle. Uh, there's not, a, okay, I'm not up to date. I don't collect the squared circles and the variants. There's one with an inverted PM error. I'm not aware of how many other errors in indicia and so on there are, if any, for Fredericton square circles. 
And last but not least, wrapping up, no self-respecting talk on Fredericton and the Brunswick Postal history can't mention Connell. Derek did a nice job at his presentation at the last meeting. Uh, I had to change what I was going to say in this one because Derek stole some of my thunder and what he said, but then that's fair game. <laughs> but what I was just showing, so I have a cover here, Charles Connell, MPP. But what I wanted to do is I, I'm introducing something different to this for the wrap up. A postcard from Fredericton mailed to Brazil. So what? Uh, a late 19, uh, 19, uh, 1893 postcard to this C.A. Caversazzi in Brazil. Bill Longley found this card. He wrote a little blurb on it, but I had a, an interesting different take on it. So he did a nice little write up and I got I was fortunate I was able to get it from him. But Caversazzi, he was a prominent philatelist from Italy who moved to Argentina in 1885 and then to Brazil in 1889. So this is one of these things of beauty of the internet, being able to latch on to an article in the Philatelic Journal of America from 1893, a PDF copy. So first of all, it adds some nice context to the cover, but I'm gonna read this, it's legible, but rather than you try to read it, it says, Dear Sir, I bought a five cent brown Connell stamp from Miss Fair. Remember, I was saying the post office uh, was a, a fair affair, whose father was in the post office of Fredericton at the time. Please mail me some, make me offer in cash or in exchange of good stamps for it. Charles Fisher, Box 77, Fredericton. Well, Charles Fisher was a prominent lawyer in Fredericton at the time. So I'm just sort of wrapping up my talk with the idea that the uniqueness of the Connell stamps was recognized quite early philatelically, uh, despite there not being all that many of those stamps around. And Thanks for bearing with me in this long presentation. Ron, uh, I think we, on behalf of the, the society, I'd like to thank you for giving an excellent presentation. This has been an education for me. As you probably know, I'm a more of a British specialist, but it's, a, it's opened my eyes to all the variations and the history of this area. I don't think I will start collecting it because I'm not going, I can't compete and, uh, and try and get uh, covers where you've got the only two ex that exist. So how can anybody else <laughs> collect them, right? <laughs> so obviously you have a, a remarkable collection of this and thank you for showing it to us.